And that concludes general questions. We turn now to First Minister's questions, and we start with question number one from Jackson Carlow. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, we've learned over the last two years that the First Minister has become a great fan of unions. So can the First Minister explain why would it be in Scotland's interest to fracture the one union that matters most to us, our own, with the rest of the United Kingdom? First Minister. Well, of course, the, the European Union is a union of independent countries, and look how it... has stood by and stood up for Ireland over these last two years. By contrast, as I said to the Prime Minister on the telephone just last night, the United Kingdom government has ignored Scotland, sidelined Scotland, cast aside Scotland's interests, now stands on the brink, not just of taking us out of the European Union against our will, or taking us out of the single market against our interests, they now stand on the brink of placing Scotland at a real competitive disadvantage Absolutely. with Northern yeah. Ireland. That's not an academic or an abstract argument. That will have real implications for jobs and living standards Absolutely. and investment Absolutely. in Scotland. Don't so I don't think the Tories uh, care uh, a jot about that. Of course, it's not so long ago that the Secretary of State for Scotland, the leader of the Scottish Conservatives, were saying that if there was a separate relationship with the UK for Northern Ireland, they would resign. Where is David Mundell today? Jackson Carlow. Order, please. Jackson Carlow. Let me be absolutely crystal clear. Others may be abandoning their post, but none of us on these benches are going anywhere. We'll be staying here. We'll be staying right here every day, every week, holding this First Minister and this Scottish Government to account. And let me be also clear, Ruth Davidson and David Mundell have spent the last year fighting for the United Kingdom. They're not going to take they're not going to take any lessons from anyone else. Not any carpetbagger who's come late to the defence of the United Kingdom. And certainly not from this First Minister. First Minister. Well, can I just try to strike one note of consensus here? I agree with Jackson Carlaw when he says that the Tories are staying exactly where they are. It's called opposition. And they don't deserve anywhere else. Now, you know, I always thought it was a really odd position for Ruth Davidson and David Mundell to argue against Northern Ireland getting a deal that protects their vital interests instead of arguing for Scotland to get a similar deal. It was standing up for the DUP rather than standing up for Scotland. But, you know, having chosen that red line and they chose it, then it is really, really hard to see how they stay in office after today with a shred of credibility. Let me quote the letter from David Mundell and Ruth Davidson just a few weeks ago. Any deal that undermines the integrity of the UK internal market or of the United Kingdom, that was a red line, they were briefing, that was a resignation issue. And then you've got Dominic Raab today, the Brexit secretary who's been involved in these negotiations, being very clear, this deal presents a very real threat to the integrity of the United Kingdom. Esther McVeigh saying exactly the same. Now, if I was as cynical and as completely self-serving as the Tories, that actually might tempt me to vote uh, for this deal, but I am not. But what is absolutely unclear to me is how uh, David Mundell or Ruth Davidson can have any other option but to follow through on the principled uh, commitment that they made. So let's see over the course of today, uh, do they have any principle, do they have a backbone between them? I suspect that answer is going to be a resounding no. Jackson Carlow. First Minister, First Minister, let's be candid with the Chamber. You and I have one very particular thing in common. Neither of us is going to be First Minister after the next Scottish election. <laughs> But I know a woman who will be, and I'm just keeping her seat warm. Yes. Fr 
fracturing the UK internal market is exactly what the First Minister continually proposes. Yeah. How if Scotland were to have a different trading arrangement from England, then as night follows day, we would create a problem where none currently exists. A border at Berwick. Scotland facing restrictions on a trading market four times as important to us as the EU. How is that standing up for Scotland? How can this possibly help our country prosper? Yeah. First you know, Minister. Jackson Carlaw uh, used to have a reputation for half-decent jokes. I think that reputation has been completely shattered over the course of this session. But Jackson Carlaw has just stood here and uttered the phrase, no problem currently exists. Is he watching what is happening in the House of Commons right now? The Tory government is imploding as we speak. People the length and breadth of the UK are seriously worried about their jobs, Absolutely. about their living standards, yeah. all of which are on the line because of the ideology of this Tory government and the complete shambles that they have made of Absolutely. the negotiation. How dare Jackson Carlaw stand in this chamber yeah. and say there is no problem? There is a big problem for Scotland, and let me spell it out to Jackson Carlaw. Scotland faces being taken out of the European Union against our democratic wishes. Scotland faces being taken out of the single market against our economic interests. And now we face being put at a competitive disadvantage to Northern Ireland. That's what the Tories are presiding office over. And Jackson Carlaw and every single member of the Tory benches should be completely and utterly ashamed of themselves. Jackson Carlaw. <laughs> It's the same tired old lines from the same tired old First Minister. You know, this First, this first Minister made her priorities clear the morning after the 2016 referendum result, before even the votes had been counted. Her first actions were to get onto her civil servants, demanding they start drafting a bill for an independence referendum. It's been that grudge and grievance agenda that has seen her act in a way which is nothing other than destructive to the negotiations that have been taking place over the last two years. And everything, everything she has said and done since has been pursued relentlessly with that goal in mind. Even now using the history of Northern Ireland with all the desperate turmoil that is involved for her singular political advantage. That's the disgrace today. So turn the First Minister's cliche in its own head and she should be thoroughly ashamed of herself. The First Minister exploiting the coming days to pursue her own goals as she has done over recent months over and over again is fundamentally against the country's interests. We need a First Minister acting for all of Scotland. Is it at time she acted in the national interest, not the nationalist interest? With with everything that's going on, with everything that's going on and acknowledging that, will she now take her threat of a second independence referendum and all the additional disruption that would cause off the table? Will she? Yes or no? Exactly. First Minister. Talk about tired old rhetoric. There's only one person in this chamber indulging in that today. And what a nerve. What an air for Jackson Carlaw to come to this chamber and talk about the importance of finding solutions for Northern Ireland. It was David Mundell and Ruth Davidson who wrote to the Prime Minister opposing a Absolutely. separate deal for Northern Ireland. All I'm asking for is if Northern Ireland is to get a separate deal for very good reasons, I support that, then Scotland should not be placed at a disadvantage as a result of that. And as for Jackson Carlaw's statement that the Scottish Government has been, what was it, uh, destructive to the negotiations. Scotland hasn't been allowed into these negotiations. We haven't had the opportunity to be destructive to the negotiations. Now, you know, I do support remaining in the European Union. I've been consistent about that. But from day one, I have put forward compromises. I have put forward the compromise of the UK staying in the single market and the customs union. I've lost count of the number of times I have asked the Prime Minister to consider that sensible option. But she's been too busy pandering uh, to the likes of Jacob Rees-Mogg. Well, I think the chickens are going to come home to roost 
on that today, as Jacob Rees-Mogg and his colleagues probably bring her down. Uh, I'm pretty confident, uh, because I'll put my case uh, to the Scottish people that I'll be First Minister after the next Scottish election. I'm not confident the Prime Minister will be in office by the end of today, such as the shambles she has created of these negotiations. And as I said earlier on, she should be ashamed of that. Jackson Carlaw should be ashamed of that. And every single Tory in the country should be ashamed of the mess they're creating for people yes. the length and breadth of the UK. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, presiding officer, Theresa May's government is falling apart before our very eyes. The Northern Ireland Minister, gone. The Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, gone. Even the Secretary of State for Brexit, gone. So can I ask the First Minister, does she agree with me that it is time for the wretched Tory government to go as well? First Minister. Yes. Richard Leonard. <laughs> Pres <laughs> Presiding officer, nothing is more emblematic of this Tory government's bankruptcy than universal credit. The rollout of the flawed universal credit is not only socially unjust, it is morally wrong. It is pushing people into poverty into homelessness and into debt. And the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions has just resigned. And why? Because of David Cameron's arrogance in calling a referendum and because of Theresa May's desperation in making promises that she knew she could never keep. So will the First Minister instruct her government this afternoon to urgently contact the DWP to press again for the rollout of universal credits to be halted? First Minister. If Richard Leonard uh, wants me to do that, yes, I will do that. But I've also lost count of the number of times the Scottish Government have contacted the, D the DWP asking for universal credit to be scrapped, for rollout uh, to be halted. But can I make a better suggestion uh, to Richard Leonard? Can I ask that he joins me? And we can do it together this afternoon. I'll sign a joint letter with him that we write a letter to the Prime Minister, if she's still in office, or to her uh, successor, or to the DWP, and we ask for power over universal credit to be taken out of the hands of the Tories and put into the hands of this Parliament. That's a better suggestion. So, I know it's First Minister's questions, but indulge me in asking Richard Leonard a question. Will you join me in making that call this afternoon? Yeah. Richard Leonard. First Minister, I've got a better idea. Let's call, oh. Let's call for a general election. The First Minister and I do not agree on many things, but I think we do agree that Theresa May's Brexit deal is a bad deal, and that's why Labour MPs will vote against the deal, and as I understand it, SNP MPs will do the same. Presiding Officer, it's my firm belief that this deal will not be agreed to by the House of Commons, that this shambolic Tory government needs to go, and that the people need more than anything a general election as a matter of urgency. So, First Minister, will you join with Labour to defeat the deal and will you back an early general election? To be... First Minister. Well, firstly, can I ju just let me unpack this step by sorry step. Firstly, I think we've just had confirmation there yet again that Richard Leonard would rather leave powers over welfare in the hands of a Tory government than bring them back to this parliament. And shame on him for that. As people suffer under universal credit and all of these welfare cuts, they will look at Labour and wonder why that is the case. But let me turn to, again to the Brexit deal. Uh, I think it's reasonable to say, if memory serves me correctly, that the SNP made clear, I made it clear to Willie Rennie in this chamber this afternoon that the SNP MPs would vote against this deal. I think we did that before <laughs> Labour did. So it's perhaps Labour joining with the SNP. But I hope, I hope uh, no party in the House of Commons falls for the Prime Minister's spin. 
that it's a case of accepting a bad deal for fear of no deal. No deal is not inevitable if this bad deal is voted down. But there is one question that remains to be answered. If that happens, what actually is Labour's position on Brexit? So again, I don't know if he's got another question, uh, but perhaps he can enlighten us today. Do they favour single market and customs union? Do they favour another vote? What exactly would Labour do on Brexit that is different to what Theresa May is doing? Because I don't have a clue. Maybe Richard Leonard can tell us. We've got a number of constituency supplementaries. The first is from Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much, presiding officer. The First Minister is all too aware of the terrible impact of the contaminated blood scandal on so many Scottish people and their families. And indeed, the First Minister has played an important role in seeking to address the disgraceful injustice so many have suffered and critically confirming that she and her government accepted the moral responsibility to provide support, including financial support, to all victims. First Minister, a constituent met with me this week to highlight her concerns and those of the Scottish Infected Blood Forum and Haemophilia Scotland about imminent decisions by her government on financial support, which are in danger of continuing the inconsistent gap in financial support between the advanced as opposed to chronically infected, a gap which is simply unjustifiable. Would the First Minister reflect on the distress being caused by reports that decisions to financial entitlement may be determined not by the clear evidence of need, but by predetermined budget constraints. Given the important role of Scotland in seeking justice for victims, will the First Minister agree to meet with me, my constituents, and those who have supported victims to ensure that we in Scotland live up to our moral responsibility to all victims of contaminated blood? First Minister. Well, can I thank Joanne Lamont for raising an issue? Uh, as she says, I've had a long-standing involvement in this issue. It was a, an issue I campaigned on uh, when I was in opposition, and I've retained that interest as Health Minister and uh, latterly as uh, First Minister. Uh, I know many of, of the people who have been affected. I have uh, one uh, in particular constituent of mine that uh, uh, I uh, understand uh, the issues from very clearly indeed. I want to, uh, and the Scottish Government is determined to see justice uh, delivered. I will ask the Health Secretary to meet with Joanne Lamont where we can discuss uh, where we are in terms of the, the progress uh, around uh, amended payments uh, and we can ensure that we listen to the representations that a constituent has made to her and that my constituents uh, make to me. So I'll ensure that that meeting can happen as quickly as possible. Mark Ruskell. <clears throat> Thank you. Would the First Minister agree that the decision by Talgo to choose Longanet as a site for their train manufacturing base, creating a thousand jobs, could be a wonderful legacy for the communities who serve the power station? And does she also believe that reopening the Alloa Dunfermline rail route to passengers should also be part of that legacy for workers and for the, uh, their communities? First Minister. Well, I warmly welcome Talgo's announcement uh, this week. Michael Matheson was in London for uh, that announcement. I uh, myself met uh, with the senior executives of Talgo some time ago to make the case for Scotland. So uh, I think all of us are delighted that this announcement has been made. It is good news for Langana and the surrounding area. I think Mark Ruskell is right to talk about the legacy benefits of that and transport links will be a key part of that. So we will uh, absolutely consider all of that as we work with Talgo uh, to make the preparations. Obviously, uh, this decision is to some extent dependent on that company winning the, the contract for HS2 that they are bidding for, uh, but we would hope uh, uh, that regardless of uh, the outcomes of that, we can persuade Talgo to go ahead uh, with that manufacturing site uh, for all of the benefits that we know that it will bring, including the ones that Mark Ruskell raises. Finlay Carson. Given the huge success of the Galloway National Park Association Conference, with overwhelming support from young and not so young constituents of Galloway and Western Fries, will the First Minister recognise the work of the Galloway National Park Association and give a commitment to initiate preliminary investigations into the feasibility of a Kingdom of Galloway National Park, which can now clearly be seen to have community and local authority support. First Minister. Well, can I uh, thank the member for raising this issue? Of course, this was an issue that our late presiding officer uh, took a, a very close interest uh, in and, and worked very hard uh, to progress. Uh, I understand uh, and appreciate the arguments that are made for a, a Galloway National Park. It's certainly something that we uh, want to give full consideration to, and I'm happy to ask the relevant minister to engage uh, with the member and with others in an interest uh, to look at how we take these things forward properly. Mark Griffin. 
President, officer, I want to raise the case of Sebastian Skelton, a 30-month-old infant whose mother, Siobhan, is struggling to get the treatment he needs from our National Health Service. Days after he was born, Sebastian developed food intolerances, which have now developed considerably. And more than a year later, he still hasn't been seen by the allergy specialist and is still going without an NHS prescription for the medication he needs. And Siobhan, his mother, has been forced to take matters into her own hands and sought help from private specialist doctors in London and Glasgow. Now, having written to the Health Secretary seven weeks ago, seeking urgent intervention and support, I've still to receive a response. Can I ask the First Minister to look into Sebastian's case and give him and his family the help they urgently need? First Minister. Well, yes, I will give that undertaking today beyond uh, what Mark Griffin has uh, narrated in the chamber today. I don't know the full details of Sebastian's case, but you know, clearly uh, we are talking about a young baby. I can understand the distress of uh, his parents, uh, and we would all want to see uh, that baby get uh, the treatment he needs as quickly as possible. I will ask the Health Secretary uh, to look into it as a, a matter of urgency and come back to the member as soon as we've had the opportunity to do so. But I uh, would also ask him to convey my very best wishes to uh, Sebastian and to his family. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's another day, it's another dose of Brexit chaos. The Prime Minister's deal, so-called, satisfies almost nobody, from Brexiteers to Remainers. It's unlikely to pass at Westminster, and the public must ultimately be given the chance to kill off Brexit in a people's vote. But if the last two years have made anything clear, it's that Scotland's future is best secured as a full, independent EU member state. Yes. The, first, the First Minister stated in this chamber in summer last year that at the end of the period of negotiation with the EU, when the terms of Brexit will be clearer, we will come back to Parliament to set out our judgment on the best way forward at that time, including our view on the precise timescale for offering a pe the people a choice over the country's future. Now, Jackson Carlaw might not want to know the answer to that, but I want to know the answer to that, and I don't think I'm alone in wanting to know the answer. Will the First Minister now confirm to us that Scotland will be given that choice, and when? Well, I, I will, as I said uh, at the time, at Patrick Harvey has uh, alluded to there, I will come back to the Chamber and set out uh, my views on the precise uh, detail of that uh, when we have clarity. Obviously, we uh, now have seen the terms of the deal. Uh, it remains to be seen whether that makes it to a vote in the House of Commons over uh, the next couple of weeks. We will see how uh, that whole sorry saga plays out, and then I will uh, give that uh, commitment, uh, undertake that commitment, as I said I would. Uh, let me say two things in addition, though. Uh, firstly, I have no doubt uh, that Scotland will get uh, an opportunity to choose again on the question of independence, and when it does, I am confident that Scotland will choose to be an independent country because the last two years, uh, from the decision uh, that risk taking us out of the EU against our will, to the way in which uh, the Scottish Government trying to represent the interests of Scotland has been sidelined, to the way in which the powers of this Parliament have been undermined, uh, the case for independence has grown stronger each and every single day. Uh, and the sooner uh, this Parliament is independent, the sooner this country is independent, no longer at the mercy of Tory governments who do not have our interests at heart, uh, the better. Um, and that time uh, will come, and when it does, I have no doubt that the people of Scotland will choose to be independent. Patrick Harvey. Well, the First Minister is right that we've only just seen this deal, uh, and it is conceivable that MPs might vote for it, I think highly unlikely. But there is already, surely, enough clarity to make a judgment, because there's nothing in Theresa May's plan that protects the social, economic and workplace rights that we have. Nothing that protects the environmental rights and protections that we have. Nothing to guarantee the future rights of EU citizens living here, or our ability to attract more of the people we need for the strength of our economy, the delivery of our public services, or the diversity of our society. And there's not a single reference to Scotland, either in the withdrawal agreement or in the absurdly simplistic paper on the future relationship. Look, the chaos of Brexit was inevitable, but we also need to face up to the equally inevitable fact 
that Scotland will only get the strong future relationship we want with Europe, as the overwhelming majority of people in Scotland voted for, if we get out there, campaign for it, and persuade people to vote for Scotland to become a full, independent EU member country. The Greens are ready to start that campaign. Is the First Minister? First Minister. The SNP started it a long, long time ago and have never stopped campaigning for independence. So my message to Patrick Harvey was, what's holding you back? Get out there and make the case for Scotland to be an independent country. Look, I, I agree with everything Patrick Harvey said there. I uh, think the case for independence, which I uh, have long thought has been made, has got stronger with every day uh, that has passed over the last two years. In terms of the precise timing uh, of Scotland having that opportunity to choose, I do think uh, people deserve a bit of clarity about what else might unfold over the next period. Are we going to have another general election? Is there going to be a second EU referendum? And, you know, I think it is reasonable to wait and allow uh, this to, to play out over these next uh, few weeks. But there is no doubt in my mind that this country uh, is going to become an independent country and it will be a far uh, more prosperous, fairer and better country when it does. It will be able to choose its own place in the world. It will be able to make its own decisions. Undoubtedly, it will make its own mistakes, but it will not be at the mercy of a Tory government imposing policies on us that we did not vote for. And that will be a far stronger position for this generation and for future generations to be in. Question number four, Willie Rennie. We were promised Northern Ireland would not be affected, but it is. That there would be a free trade deal, but there isn't. The UK would not be subject to EU laws, but it will be. Our fishing grounds would be protected, but they won't. And the biggest lie of all, there's not £350 million a week for the NHS. The people have been cheated. Can the First Minister think of a single reason why there should not be a people's vote so we can stop Brexit now? First well, I've made my views on this clear. Willie Rennie and I have had this exchange now many times. If there is a proposal for a people's vote, I think that we should support that. I think people across the UK should have that opportunity. I guess the same question that I've posed to Willie Rennie, though, remains. Uh, what if the result in a second referendum is the same as it was in 2016? Scotland votes overwhelmingly, probably even more overwhelmingly, to remain uh, in the EU, but the UK as a whole votes to leave. And I will posit that again to Willie Rennie. What would he suggest Scotland does in those circumstances? Willie Rennie. And, and the First Minister knows that I think we can win this people's vote. I want to keep the United Kingdom together and I want to keep us in the European Union as well. The future of this deal could lie in the hands of Scottish Conservative MPs. They've been ignored on fishing, ignored on Northern Ireland, but they still do nothing. They are as useless as a piano in a pigsty. As ministers resign on principle, where are the principles of the Scottish Conservatives? The Prime Minister said that stopping Brexit is now an option. With the Cabinet divided and the Parliament split, the case for a people's vote grows stronger every day. Now is the best chance. Does the First Minister agree that this Parliament and her Government's first priority should be to secure that people's vote? First Minister. I've got a feeling there was an insult to pigs somewhere in <laughs> Willie Rennie's question, but I can't quite work out what it was, so I probably shouldn't go any further down that road. What I would say, if he's right, and the future of the deal and the future of the country depends on the 13 Conservative MPs, then we're all doomed, because what they have, <laughs> what they have uh, demonstrated is that they don't have a backbone between them, uh, and they will sell Scotland out uh, as quickly uh, as anything. But on the issue, uh, yes, I think if there's an opportunity to stop Brexit in its tracks across the whole of the UK, then we should take that. Uh, I have uh, no doubt in my mind about that because the promises that were made in 2016 have been proven uh, to be, in most cases, lies. Uh, the negotiation has been shambolic and we're left in the position we're in today uh, where there is a bad deal and the Tories haven't spent, uh, the Prime Minister haven't spent the last two years saying 
uh, that no deal is better than a bad deal is now in the ridiculous, pathetic position of saying that a bad deal is better than no deal. So if that opportunity to stop it in its tracks is there, yes, I think people across the UK should take that. Uh, but I want to do more than that. I want to make sure that as well as hopefully stopping Brexit in its tracks, we can ensure that never ever again is Scotland put in the position of facing something like Brexit against our democratic wishes. Yeah, yeah. And a second EU referendum, while it m might stop Brexit, doesn't guarantee that that will be the case. So Willie Rennie dodged that question uh, the first time, but he can't continue to dodge that question. Uh, I'll support a people's vote to stop Brexit, but if Scotland yet again finds itself in the position of facing Brexit against as well, will Willie Rennie support independence so that we can take control of our own future? Thank you. We've got a, quite a lot of interest in asking supplementaries. The first from Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the First Minister, like me, welcome the U-turn by the UK Government and at long last the reduction of the stakes of FOB tea machines to £2 will finally be introduced from April 2019? And what steps can the Scottish Government also take, well, or help to take to tackle the issue of problem gambling, particularly with young people? First Minister. Yes, I do welcome uh, this U-turn, although it is long overdue. Let me also take the opportunity to congratulate Stuart McMillan on all of the very yeah, good yeah. and hard work yeah, he yeah. has done yeah. on this issue. <laughs> We've been clear for a long time that action like this is needed. Earlier this month, the Community Safety Minister wrote to the UK Government expressing concern about the delay in the implementation of this policy. Uh, and I do commend uh, Stuart and all campaigners on this issue uh, following a sustained and effective campaign for such a move. The Scottish Government encourages any actions that can help reduce the harmful impact of problem gambling. Uh, that's why we're seeking to deliver faster access to psychological therapies for people uh, with mental illnesses, including those who have problems uh, with gambling. Those seeking clinical support will benefit from the work being done uh, also through the mental health strategy. So the Scottish Government will continue to take action where we can, uh, but we look to the UK Government to take this action, uh, which is, as I say, long overdue, but I'm glad that it is now happening. And ask our to be followed by Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Today, the first multi-faith remembrance service will be held in Canusi for the soldiers of the British Indian Army, whose graves have been discovered there and elsewhere in Scotland. These 13 young men came to Scotland, have been evacuated from Dunkirk during the Second World War. They are our forgotten heroes. Ali Bahadur, Barry Sher, Dadan Khan, Fuzzle Ali, Khan Muhammad, Kushi Muhammad, Muhammad, Muhammad Sadiq, Mushtaq Ahmed, Mir Zaman, Abdul Rahman, Gulam Nabi, and Karam Dad. Does the First Minister agree with me that their names should be forgotten no more and there should be a permanent memorial in Scotland to commemorate their lives and that of the 161,000 soldiers of the British Indian Army who lost their lives in defence of our country so that their contribution is remembered for generations to come? First Minister. Yes, I, I do agree with Anna Sarwar and thank him for raising this issue and for raising it in the way he did. He's right to say that these were forgotten heroes. Today, as a result of that question, uh, their names are on the official report of the Scottish Parliament and they will be forgotten no longer. So uh, for that, let me thank Anna Sarwar. Um, I welcome the multi-faith uh, remembrance service that's taking place today. I think that is very fitting and it's an opportunity. Uh, to remember and to remember with gratitude the contribution of the British Indian Army uh, to the war effort. Of course, we've just passed Armistice Day where uh, we commemorated the centenary of the end of the First World War uh, and also remembered all of those who uh, have lost their lives in conflicts throughout the last century. And we must uh, make sure that when we do that, we remember everybody. Um, and uh, I certainly would be very happy to take forward discussions about the possibility of a permanent memorial. And I will ask uh, the relevant minister to contact Anna Sarwar to kick off those discussions as soon as possible. Bruce Crawford to be followed by Polly McNeill. Thank you, President Officer. Given that it's now clear that the Prime Minister's Brexit deal is dead in the water and it cannot command a majority in the House of Commons, will the First Minister commit to working with others so that we can replace the current Westminster chaos with a common sense plan to keep Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom in the single market and the customs union? The people of this country, who are very worried at this very moment about what's going on, 
deserve a pragmatic and sensible solution. How can the First Minister help? First Minister. Well, firstly, Bruce Crawford is right to say uh, that the deal that the Prime Minister has brought forward is dead in the water. I mean, she doesn't need me to tell her that. Uh, her own backbenchers have been lining up in the House of Commons uh, this morning to tell her that. Let, let me say a word about the Prime Minister because I think she does deserve a degree of respect for the resilience she has shown in trying to bring forward a deal that she thought was the right thing to do. So, you know, I will gladly uh, say that about her, but she has to recognise the reality of the position she faces. The deal is not going to get through the House of Commons. Um, and therefore, it is wrong for anybody to suggest that that means crashing out with no deal on the 29th of March next year is an inevitability. It is not an inevitability. There is now a duty on everyone, uh, principally in the House of Commons, because that's where the decisions are taken, to come together to look at sensible alternatives. Now, I've said consistently uh, that single market customs union membership for the whole of the UK would be the best possible compromise position. It's not my uh, top preference. I would rather we stayed in the European Union. But if we're looking at compromises, that is both the best one and it's also the one, and there's, I readily say there's no guarantee of this, but it is the only compromise that I can look at the House of Commons and actually see a path to a majority for. So this is the moment for people, yes, to put party interests aside and to come together and find a way through this. Simply blundering on with a deal that is destined to fail is not putting the interests of the country first and I appeal to the Prime Minister not to do that. Pauline McNeill to be followed by John Finney. Thank you. The tragic death of 16-year-old William Lindsay in Pullman prison whilst on remand raises many sharp questions about our criminal justice system and in particular the availability of secure accommodation and I'm sure the First Minister will join with me in offering condolences to William's family. But is the First Minister aware that by all accounts those who worked with William said that he was crying out for help and that prison was not the right place for a young man who spent his life in care? Can the First Minister explain why the 2016-2017 figures show a reduction of 11% in the number of secure places and the complete closure of one unit with 29% decline in the use of residents in Scotland? Does the First Minister agree that for these reasons and many more, there is a need for an urgent review of the availability of secure accommodation? First Minister. Well, this is um, a serious issue that, yes, does have to be seriously looked at. The, the Cabinet uh, discussed this uh, at some length in, in the context of this tragic uh, case uh, just on Tuesday. Let me start, of course, by putting on record my sincere condolences to the family of William Lindsay, who I know is also known as William Brown. Uh, I would also take the opportunity to put on record my condolences to the family of Katie Allen, uh, who also died in, in Pullman recently. Hamza Yusuf met with her family uh, earlier uh, this week, and I'm grateful to them for taking the time uh, to attend that meeting and to allow us to hear their views about their dreadful experience. I don't think any of us can imagine uh, the distress that both of these families are going through. Uh, clearly, we are determined that any lessons that need to be learned will be learned. All uh, appropriate agencies must look closely uh, at what happened here. Uh, there will be mandatory fatal accident inquiries in these cases, of course, and, and while these processes are ongoing, I think it would not be appropriate for me to get into the details of the individual cases. But what I will say, uh, looking in particular uh, right now at the case of uh, William Lindsay, there are a number of things that I know uh, as First Minister I want to address and make sure we look at properly. Uh, experience in the care system, for example. We have the independent review of the care system underway right now. Uh, the issue of secure care provision is certainly one of those issues. Uh, how we do even more to keep young people out of the criminal justice system uh, altogether. And of course, uh, the issues of mental health support within Pullman uh, itself. So these are all issues under the active consideration of the Scottish Government. As I say, there will be mandatory FEIs uh, in these uh, cases, rightly so, but we will not wait for that before taking action that we uh, consider is necessary to make sure that any issues here are properly addressed. John Finney. Okay, thank you, President Officer. The First Minister may be aware of two instances of illegal scallop dredging in protected area of West Ross. I've consistently raised the issue of maritime protection and enforcement, and that's particularly with regard to the expansion of MPAs and Brexit, and been assured it's under review. Does the First Minister agree with Open Seas that there is now a clear case for robust tamper-proof vessel tracking? 
First Minister. I have seen uh, this morning uh, some reports of uh, the instances that John Finney has raised. I, I haven't yet had the opportunity to look into all of the details of that. Certainly, uh, the suggestion that John Finney is made is one that is worthy of our consideration. I will ask the Environment Secretary to uh, look into this issue uh, in more depth and then contact John Finney uh, to discuss the matter further. Thank you. Question number five, Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government is marking anti-bullying week. First Minister. Anti-Bullying Week 2018 provides us with the opportunity to send a clear and positive message that bullying of any kind is totally unacceptable and when it happens we all have a responsibility to address it. The theme is Choose Respect which reinforces the messages of respect, positive relationships and empathy and I would encourage everyone to spread uh, that message. I was particularly pleased that in time for the start of Anti-Bullying Week last Thursday, the Deputy First Minister was able to announce that we have accepted in full the recommendations of the LGBTI Inclusive Education Working Group report, including its recommendations on tackling bullying. Uh, that's just uh, the latest substantial step forward we are taking. I'm sure the whole chamber will agree that we must always look to instill the values of tolerance and respect in our children and young people to help them develop positive relationships. McGregor. Yeah, I thank the First Minister for that response. We know that bullying can have an extremely damaging effect on a young person's mental health and in some tragic cases can result in suicide or attempted suicide. What can be done to assist schools to better support those who are bullied at school as well as those who perpetrate bullying who may also be experiencing difficulties elsewhere? First Minister. Well, Fulton McGregor is right to raise this issue. Uh, we take child and adolescent mental health very seriously. We've discussed in this chamber uh, many times previously the, the challenges of making sure that services are there in the right places for young people. Uh, our commitment to invest over £60 million in additional school counselling services, supporting 350 counsellors, will, however, help to ensure that support is in place. Respect for all is our national approach to preventing and responding to bullying incidents. It makes clear that bullying is not just the responsibility of schools, but of all adults involved in the lives of young people, including supporting the child experiencing bullying and the child displaying bullying behaviour. Respect for all includes an expectation that all schools develop and implement an anti-bullying policy, which should be reviewed and updated on a regular basis. Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Seven weeks ago, First Minister, you would not agree to a full independent inquiry into allegations of bullying at NHS Highland. Given that we're now going to have an independent inquiry, can you confirm that the Scottish Government will encourage all those that they believe that were bullied, including any that have signed non-disclosure agreements, to give evidence? First Minister. I would encourage... Uh, not just encourage, but support anybody who has experience of bullying in NHS Tayside or anywhere else to come forward uh, and discuss their experience. So I absolutely uh, agree with that. And I hope all of uh, the Chamber will welcome the action the Health Secretary is taking, uh, which sends a very clear message uh, that we will not tolerate bullying in any organisation. Question number six, Jamie Green. Uh, to ask the First Minister what plans the Scottish Government has to evaluate the impact on sales of minimum unit pricing of alcohol. First Minister. Well, Scotland's uh, world leading minimum pricing measure targets the low cost, high strength alcohol, which causes so much damage to our communities. It's been in place now for just six months. A reason for introducing minimum unit pricing is specifically to reduce alcohol related harms. It will of course be at least a couple of years before necessary data is available to analyse impacts robustly. Our extensive monitoring and evaluation programme is being led by NHS Health Scotland and it includes examining implementation and compliance, price and product range, alcohol sales and consumption, alcohol related harm and the economic impact on industry. And I look forward to seeing full and robust data when considering the range of impacts that the policy is having. Jamie Green. Uh, can I thank the First Minister for the confirmation of that ongoing monitoring, but you may be aware that since uh, the legislation came into effect six months ago, uh, sales of one uh, well-known and quite potent drink has increased by 11%. And what some people regard as a trade-off is drinkers move from one high-strength product to another. Now, we all hope that this is not an unintended consequence of the policy. And whilst it benefited from cross-party support at the time, it was conditional on a sensible sunset clause. And this will ensure that a fact-based approach would form the basis of the success or otherwise of the legislation. So can I ask the First Minister, uh, what public health targets were set in relation to the introduction of minimum unit pricing and are those targets being met? 
First Minister. Do you know, it, it was to the credit of the Tories, Jackson Carlow in particular, if I may say so, that the Tories actually supported minimum unit pricing. They did so before, I don't even know if Labour does yet support minimum unit pricing. But really, it's not been in place for more than six months yet, and already uh, Jamie Green appears to be shaping up to criticise it. For goodness sake, let us give it a chance. The sunset clause was put in place. I think it was Jackson Carlaw that proposed the amendment for that. The government accepted it. Uh, we put in place robust monitoring and review procedures, uh, and all of the indicators around that will be properly monitored. Of course, the experts here themselves point out it is far too early to start to judge the success of uh, this policy. We also uh, have seen uh, some indication of uh, a rise in alcohol sales, a substantial ri alcohol uh, rise in sales in England, uh, more than in Scotland, which if there is any early indications might be that minimum unit pricing uh, has helped to peg that back in Scotland. So I hope we continue to have uh, the support of the Scottish Conservatives. This is an important policy. It, it was a brave move of this Parliament to put it into place. I believe that it will work, but let's give it a chance and let's do the monitoring in the proper and full way. Thank you very much. That concludes First Minister's questions. We'll move on shortly to members' business in the name of Ruth Maguire on Day of the Imprisoned Writer. Uh, until then, just to allow the gallery to clear and for members and ministers to change seats, we'll have a short suspension.